Regarding our topic today, which is birthmark or vascular anomalies, as we may know, it's the commonest uh, cutaneous tumor. Uh, may I welcome our professor, the speaker, our professor Marcelo Hoshman, who is chief surgeon at the Facial Surgery Center in South Carolina, USA. He is a medical director and the founder of Hemangioma Treatment Foundation in USA. Also in the panel uh, with us is Dr. Adel from Riyadh. He is the head of the Department of Plastic Surgery. And Dr. Hazem Dashan, he is plastic surgeon again from Cairo, from the Saudi German Hospital Group. Welcome you. Uh, Dr. Professor Marcello, uh, you could start, please. Thank you regarding the definition, the classification, the treatment and complications, uh, all uh, regarding the hemangioma and the vascular anomalies. Thank you. Please start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we start, I want to, of course, thank the leadership of Saudi General for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, to join you tonight. And um, the topic, as was mentioned, is vascular anomalies. And the subtitle is that they don't just go away. Um, many things have changed since I was in medical school, which was a long time ago. And uh, much of what I'm gonna be speaking about this evening really is not anything that I learned when I was in training because so many things have changed. So as with all of medicine, of course, the initial thing is to establish the diagnosis. And um, it is, even though these two lesions are very similar in appearance, as are these, the one on the left on both sides are lesions that appeared within the first few weeks of life and, the, um, and rapidly proliferated, whereas the ones on the right in both sets have been slowly growing over the lifetime of the individual. And you can see that this is an adult. So the diagnosis of what kind of vascular anomaly is critical because it has implications for treatment and prognosis. In this paper, it was shown that 60% of vascular anomalies that are referred to a tertiary uh, clinic are misdiagnosed, which means then that of course there is a potential for mistreatment. So once we know what it is, how do you intervene? Of course, in a situation where there's impending or actual visual loss, it seems pretty, pretty um, uh, self-explanatory that you would intervene very quickly, um, but what about in a very, very early lesion? Um, at what point do you actually intervene? Do you wait until something else happens? Or really, how long do you wait until the child is much older or even as an adult, I mean, I'm sorry, even farther on, at what point do you intervene in this whole scheme? And more importantly, how do we intervene? What methods and what uh, tools do we have to, um, to intervene and, and provide treatment. This is probably the most important slide I'm gonna show you and I'll show you different versions of it, but the family is vascular anomalies and there are two main groups. There are tumors and malformations. So this is critical. Not all vascular anomalies are the same. There is a subset which are tumors and there is a subset which are malformations. The tumors are true endothelial cell neoplasms. They behave like tumors. They're benign in the most cases, though there are some that are not, and they exhibit all the different things that tumors show. Malformations, on the other hand, are aberrant errors of vasculogenesis. So this is embryonic and, um, and uh, developmental abnormalities of the anatomy of the various types of vessels. They are non-proliferative. They uh, tend to be increased with somatic mutations, though the tumors tend not to be, and can be associated with a variety of syndromes. So this is critical that we know and be able to categorize the, um, the, the uh, lesions into these categories. This website, isva.org, or the, in, uh, the International uh, Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies, this classification is the internationally accepted um, classification and the one that we're going to be using today. It is an interactive website where you can click on the various things and it takes you to further pages uh, down the line. 
I'm going to spend a few minutes speaking about malformations, though we're going to spend the, the most time on the tumors. So the ISFA classification, we talk about malformations based on the vessels that are involved, whether they be arterial or venous or lymphatic or capillary vessels or some combination of those. So we have arteriovenous malformations and lymphatic venous or capillary venolymphatic. So depending on which vessels are involved, we see a variety of different um, presentations um, in terms of the patients. The most common of the malformations are the venous malformations. And 50% of them are associated with a mutation of TI2. Uh, TI is the uh, tunica interna endothelial um, cell kinase. And it has to do with uh, the, the, the permeability and the structure of the veins. As you know, veins typically have multiple layers of, um, of muscles, but that cobblestone morphology is lost um, with varying degrees of expression of the TIE 2 mutation. Um, so that leads to, as you see down here, a very weak single cell, mechanically unstable vessel through which the blood does not flow normally. So there's low flow, which is one of the characteristics of these malformations. And internally, there's spontaneous thrombosis and thrombolysis that occurs. Because of that, you have increased D-dimers. And this is the only disease that can permanently increase D-dimer levels in an otherwise healthy individual. Of course, increased D-dimers are associated with a variety of other um, hematologic conditions, but in terms of a healthy individual with a vascular anomaly, this is a biomarker for venous malformations. <clears throat> the natural history is that though they are present at birth, they may not be apparent. So because it is a, an abnormality of vasculogenesis, it has to be present at birth, though it may not be apparent, and it becomes apparent at some point in life, sometimes at the time of birth, but many times later on. And the natural history is one of slow, continuous growth throughout the lifetime of the individual. So these never show signs of regression. So there's a variety of just examples of different kinds of malformations. This is a lymphatic malformation or what you know, classically would have been called a cystic hygroma. That term has now been replaced by lymphatic malformation, arterial venous malformation. This is a uh, syndrome or called blue rubber, a uh, blue bleb nevus syndrome, which has a variety of small focal malformations. This is a combination of lymphatic venous malformation, obviously some associated with musculoskeletal uh, abnormalities. And this is an interesting one. This is a venous malformation, which because by definition was present at birth, it did not become apparent until pregnancy. So this is a young woman who throughout her life didn't have any idea that she had anything, but during pregnancy developed this large mass. And it is because we know that some venous malformations are responsive to some of the hormonal uh, influences of puberty and and uh, pregnancy. The treatment goal for malformations, we can affect total removal in some smaller malformations, but the reality is that the, the vast majority of our uh, efforts are designed to control the growth. Remember, these will grow throughout the lifetime of the individual, some to a great degree, some to a small degree, but the natural history is that. And um, of course, the, uh, the multimodality treatment ends up being sort of the theme for treatment for most of these uh, lesions that we're going to talk about. So surgery, occasionally we have the opportunity to remove an entire lesion and for cure, though that is um, not often the case. Lasers are very common, a uh, variety of lasers with different uh, chromatophores, which we can treat. Um, Medical therapy is important. Much of it is supportive with uh, compression uh, garments and uh, elevation for extremity lesions, of course, not as easy for the head and neck. Um, and then more recently, some metabolic pathway inhibitors, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. 
the mainstay of treatment for controlling growth of VMs, LMs, AVMs, et cetera, is interventional radiology. So it's important that we have a relationship with our uh, IR colleagues um, for sclerotherapy and embolization, um, either as definitive treatment, control, or preoperative treatment sometimes as well. Again, some you know, clinical examples, capillary malformations are commonly known as port wine stains, laser treatment, virtually all malforma capillary malformations will respond, though very few will clear completely. And if you wait long enough, many of these will actually start getting uh, darker again, because again, the error is an inborn error um, in these vessels themselves. Same thing for microcystic lymphatic malformations. We can resurface the mucosa, we can treat it, but then over time that will come back. We now have, again, some metabolic inhi inhibitors that we would be able to use in, uh, in conjunction with this as well. And um, the um, occasional isolated focal venous malformation, which we can remove, Obviously, first we do preoperative imaging to make sure that this is not the quote tip of the iceberg. Um, and in fact, it was a very simple isolated lesion which was able to be surgically excised. Not the most common. Similar type of thing here, a venous malformation involving the uh, eyelid, conjunctiva and deeper tissues. Again, the purpose of surgery here uh, was for debulking and then setting the stage for further laser treatment. The, um, the deep portion of this were very small, so IR was not uh, a real option. So again, we have used surgery as one form of treatment and set the stage for the treatment of the conjunctival portion um, and by time for this individual um, for this venous malformation to um, to be treated over time. This is a, a lady which um, I saw who had had four previous operations for treatment of quote, a hemangioma. Okay, so this is one of those that's misdiagnosed. And of course she has a venous malformation. She's too old to have a hemangioma. It has constantly begin, been getting bigger over time, which is classic for, so um, we went ahead and did a wide local resection with a microvascular free flap reconstruction. And of course she now wears a hairpiece. But again, this highlights the fact that the diagnosis, so she has waited 30 something years expecting the quote hemangioma to go away. And in fact, it's only getting worse over time. And the surgeries were aborted because they weren't prepared for the type of lesion that this was. Arterial venous malformation with ulceration. Um, again, surgery ends up being um, a salvage procedure for this. Um, this had been embolized and uh, ulcerated. So again, there's different combinations and roles for all of these things. This is a young child with, uh, that I've been treating since she was very young. She's now a couple of years older than this. And we've used a combination of surgery and intralesional um, sclerotherapy and intralesional um, laser therapy. So again, a combination or multimodality, but this will be an ongoing problem during her lifetime to some degree. A young uh, baby that we brought from China that uh, had a massive venous malformation of the tongue and uh, remarkably enough was able to eat, drink and, uh, and uh, thrive. And this is over time, uh, really our IR colleagues did most of the work for this. Um, but um, she has now uh, undergone orthognathic surgery, and here's a child who, um, even though there has been an enormous improvement, we know by imaging that there's still some persistent um, uh, malformation in the tongue, which will need to be treated over time, but in fact, this child is now able to go to school, and, uh, and um, again, knowing the correct diagnosis prepares her for future treatments uh, um, in the future. So capillary malformations or port wine stains, very common. Again, um, this is what happens typically over time. You get nodularity, you get progression of these vessels that are growing within the skin. A special type of uh, 
Capillary Malformation Association, which again is Sturge Weber syndrome. I know everybody is familiar with this, but the reason that I mention this is that very commonly the vascular birthmark associated with this is called a hemangioma. And um, it has a totally different um, uh, natural history. Um, and in fact, um, the association of the V1 uh, malformation with an ipsilateral leptomeningeal malformation, um, there's an increase in, uh, in uh, seizures. Um, by the first year of age, there's an increased association with glaucoma. And we now know that there is a GNAC mutation, which is uh, associated with this. One of the other lesions that is seen in ophthalmology is what is called in the literature, a choroidal hemangioma, very commonly associated with Sturge Weber syndrome. We actually then showed that by taking biopsies of the capillary malformation, uh, tissue from the uh, intracerebral portion and from retinal tissue in eyes that had been enucleated for blindness and painful eye, that in fact the same mutation is found in all of them. So we are now proposing that choroidal hemangioma be actually dropped as a term because it is not a hemangioma, as we'll discuss in a minute, but has um, all the features of the malformation, which makes sense in association with the clinical picture that we see. And of course, there are treatment implications um, when um, something is called a malformation versus a hemangioma, which we'll go over here in just a minute. Serolimus, which is a, a, a medical, I'm sorry, a metabolic inhibitor, or rapamycin, is sort of the new wonder drug for a lot of these lesions, uh, particularly very complicated lymphatic venous uh, uh, combination lesions, and um, one that we're using quite commonly in association with our hematology, on, hematology oncology colleagues, um, which again is another specialty that needs to be sort of integrated into the management of these uh, lesions. I'm gonna spend the rest of the time speaking about the vascular tumors, Again, this is the ISVA classification. We are now on the other side. So we talked about malformations briefly, and now the tumors. As uh, Dr. Hilal mentioned, um, the benign vascular tumors, or in particular infantile hemangiomas, are the most common benign tumor of infancy. So many specialties will see those. Under the benign tumors, we see IH, or infantile hemangioma, congenital hemangiomas, pyogenic granulomas, which are extraordinarily common. We see some locally aggressive, which I'll mention KHE in just a minute, and some malignant vascular tumors, which I will not spend any time on. So under the tumors, again, the three that we will talk about are the congenital ones, the Kaposi-form hemangioendothelioma, and then IH spend the rest of the time that we have together. Congenital hemangiomas are characterized by being fully formed at the time of birth. The baby is born and there is a lesion which is fully formed. Um, and then there are two different paths that these congenital hemangiomas can take. Within the first year, some of them will rapidly involute or regress and some of them will not. So according to that history is where we then determine which one it is. I'm going to mention that these are GLUT1 negative, um, and we'll talk about that in relationship to infantile hemangioma. So that's a very important point. But again, clinically, what we see is a fully formed tumor at birth, but very quickly starts regressing. And then over the first year, uh, regresses to a given point. Um, same thing here. And then we go back and, and can do something about the extra skin uh, in the arm. But this is, there is really no treatment. This is just the natural history of rich or rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma. Opposite of that, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, um, a non-involuting or a niche would basically go look like this, but would basically look the same during that first year and then it would be treated. So the, the main differentiation or the, the only differentiation is in terms of its natural history. 
Keiichi or Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma is a very important lesion to be aware of. It is now in the locally aggressive group of uh, tumors. Um, girls and boys are affected equally and clinically they present as these firm purplish macules um, or, um, or masses. Um, they can involve uh, internal organs like everything else except for hemangiomas, they are GLUT1 negative on biopsy. And these are the ones that it's a little bit hard sometimes to tell what they are. So a baby is born, there's a little bit of a, of a mark, the tumor grows, um, doesn't quite look like or feel like a hemangioma, certainly not a malformation. So these are some that we occasionally will biopsy. And the reason for that is that the diagnosis of KHE is the only one that is associated with Kaposi for, I'm sorry, with Kassebach merit phenomenon, which as you know, is a rare uh, consumptive coagulopathy characterized by severe thrombocytopenia because of platelet trapping within the tumor. So again, very important to determine the diagnosis because then it leads us into potential treatment schema. And finally, IH, infantile hemangiomas um, are extraordinarily common. They appear with or affect between four and 10% of uh, newborn infants. Um, they can range from pinpoint lesions, which is why they're so common to functionally and cosmetically um, important lesions. Females are affected more commonly and the majority of them are found um, in the head and neck area, which is one of the reasons why they're so important to diagnose and treat early on. Most of them are not present at birth. Some of them are, and there we'll talk about the natural history in just a second. And there is a definite correlation between low birth weight and the incidence of hemangioma. So we very commonly will see twins or triplets and one or two of them will have hemangiomas, not because they're twins or triplets, because they tend to be very small babies. And there's a definite association in that. As I mentioned, these are true benign neoplasms um, of endothelial cells, and they're characterized by a very peculiar natural history. They're not present at birth. They appear within the first few weeks um, and proliferate or grow. And then at some point, they start involuting or regression, and this is where all the confusion comes in, to some degree over some period of time. They don't just go away. Again, if you start off with something that is a few millimeters big, and over time it gets smaller, it may in fact be imperceptible, but if you start with something with bigger volume, even though it does involute, for example, 50 or 75%, there may still be something left. So again, they all proliferate, they all involute to some degree over some period of time. The diagnosis can be made clinically within seconds and certainly within a few minutes of talking to the parents. Um, very rarely do we need imaging studies to determine the diagnosis or the extent. We'll talk about some special circumstances. And GLUT1 positive is the differentiating factor in terms of biopsies. So if we biopsy a lesion because we're not sure what it is by history or presentation, if it is negative, it is not a hemangioma. On the other side, if it is positive, it is not some of the other things that we talked about. I want you to look at this slide very carefully and take a look at these various definitions, capillary, cavernous, you know, stork bite, strawberry, and I want you to forget about those terms. I don't want you to, to use those terms because we now talk about hemangiomas specifically related to the degree of involvement of the skin. So all hemangiomas can be described as either superficial, deep, compound, focal, or segmental. So here is a superficial lesion. It will only get thicker. This is a deep lesion. Again, it involves the deeper part of the dermis, but not the superficial part. And this is, of course, a compound one. Here we have a baby with a focal lesion of the nasal tip and a segmental hemangioma of the forehead and periorbital area. 
This cannot be associated with Sturge Weber syndrome, even though it may look like it, because it's a hemangioma and not a capillary malformation. Segmental hemangioma is a special subset. Uh, they're more commonly associated with other uh, developmental um, abnormalities. They have a less favorable outcome in general, aesthetically. And those that involve the beard distribution, this anterior lower portion of the face, have a very high incidence of subglottic lesions, which is why our otolaryngology colleagues need to be involved with these babies. Uh, for endoscopy and uh, potential airway management. Um, there are some segmental hemangiomas which are associated with um, a variety of intracranial, arterial defects, cardiac defects, and this is of course the facies syndrome. This is a subset of babies that do need imaging because we need to find out what, what, what other um, abnormalities they may have in order to be able to manage them. The same segmental lesion over the lumbosacral area is associated with tethered cord and perforate anus and some other lesions. So again, segmental hemangiomas need to be listed or, or looked at a little bit different than, uh, than the focal ones. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just talking about where do these come from? They, we know the natural history, which is, you know, this, they're not present at birth, they appear, they start proliferating. These are a set of twins with both of them having a little bit different presentation. Um, and there's three different uh, theories as to where they may come from. The cellular and molecular theory talks about endothelial progenitor cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and hemangioma-derived stem cells, which have been shown in the lab and that perhaps there are, or not perhaps, that there are uh, two very important pathways that help or that promote um, the, um, these cells to become hemangiomas. We know that EPCs differentiate into endothelial cells, and it's been shown that babies with hemangiomas have a 15-fold increase in circulating, circulating levels of CD34, 133 cells, and others, which are characteristic of EPCs. So they, these cells are circulating in the bloodstream, and we know that these are the cells that will then potentially turn into um, endothelial cells and then potentially into tumors of endothelial cells. The endothelium of, endo, of uh, IH uniquely co-express with placenta this GLUT1 uh, glucose transporter protein one, um, which I've mentioned a couple of times. So placenta and hemangiomas, both are GLUT1 positive and most, almost virtually all other tissues are GLUT1 negatives. And what's interesting is that if you, if you compare the transcriptome or the MRA, mRNA transcribed from the genome um, of placenta NIH, they are very, very similar. So just like if you take a, a tumor of the lung and compare its trans, transcriptome to a lung parenchyma, those are very similar, which denotes that there's some you know, semblance of where these might come from. Well, the same thing happens between the transcriptome of placenta and IH, which leads to think maybe these cells come from the placenta. So that's one of the theories that has been, but not been proven. We also have GLUT1 positive vessels, which have these uh, stem cells which involute into adipocytes in vitro. So if you take these uh, cells and implant them in a nude mouse, we can get them to grow. And then over time, very rapidly compared to the human, these cells will then involute into adipocytes or turn into fat, which is exactly what happens with hemangiomas. The VEGF pathway is one that's important to mention. As you know, the, um, it is one of the most um, highly conserved pathways um, and uh, any deletion of the VEGFR2 receptor leads to early embryonic death. So it is a highly conserved receptor which is involved in uh, angiogenesis and neovascularization. The VEGFR2 or the, or the receptor 2 is the one that is most important and it is down-regulated uh, during uh, normal states. 
VEGFR1 is the dummy receptor that um, attracts and sort of binds circulating VEGF when it's not needed. VEGFR2 is then upregulated during angiogenesis and neovascularization. And then downstream, there's a variety of pathways that lead to angiogenesis. In hemangiomas, we know that there are some differences in this, um, this protein, TEM8, which, uh, which on uh, the VEGFR2, the hemangioma endothelial cells have suppressed VEGFR1. So now this is the decoy receptor that sort of mops up the VEGF. It is downregulated. Now the VEGF that's around actually activates the pathways and you get angiogenesis proliferation and a variety of other downstream effects. So again, I mentioned these, where do these come from? That there's the hypothesis that they may come from the placenta. And then there's also a hypothesis that says, or that tries to address why do these appear in certain areas? As we know, breast, prostate, and other cancers um, end up metastasizing to certain areas. Um, placentas tend, I'm sorry, uh, hemangiomas tend to prefer certain sites. So part of the question is what is at those sites of predilection? So if you map out where hemangiomas appear on the face, they tend to fall along these uh, planes of fusion and very highly predictable areas of the central face and then along the mandibular border, as I mentioned earlier. When these first appear, very often there's this halo around the lesion which is thought to be vasoconstriction. That leads to the thinking that um, hypoxia-induced factor 1-alpha or HIF1 um, is involved potentially in these cells being drawn to that area. So HIF1A induces proliferation or transcription of VEGF and erythropoietin, which then led, leads to a sprouting of uh, vessels in terms of when we're trying to repair injuries and such. But in the condition of um, hypoxia and um, the, an important thing that's been found is that these beta adrenergic receptors lead to H1F um, expression in the presence of hypoxia, which again leads to transcription of VEGF and EPO. And again, if you now have upregulated VEGFR2 receptors, you now get this cascade of, um, of angiogenesis and neovascularization. So if we put all of these things together, that there's some endothelial progenitor cells, there's some mutation or change in the VEGF receptors, that there's something in these sites that may be perhaps related to hypoxia leading to all these processes, is the switch potentially the beta adrenergic receptors? We're going to address that here in just a second. So again, the natural history, the hallmark is nothing present at birth. Very quickly, there is appearance of a lesion, proliferation of the lesion, and eventual involution to some degree over some period of time. Again, the maximum amount of proliferation is in the first two months. Most of them stop growing by four to six months, and the maximum rate of, um, of um, involution occurs in the first two years. And then there's some decreasing amount of involution that occurs over time. So here is a lesion in proliferation, a good example. Again, they are now still waiting for this lesion to go away, quote unquote. If you look at this histologically, it is a solid tumor with very few vessels. Um, and then as involution occurs, you see this tumor being replaced by fibro fatty tissue. And that is what we saw in the lab. There are some complications in sequelae, uncommon in terms of cartilage destruction, but possible. You see uh, anidoderma or a variety of telangiectasias and scarring and stretching of the skin. And these are some of the things that we wanna to try to avoid. So the dogma and what I was taught in medical school was leave it alone, it will go away, 50% will go away in five years, 70% in seven years, et cetera, et cetera. And I can tell you that that is not what happens, okay? 
100% of hemangiomas will involute to some degree over some period of time. And again, if we go back to the fact that many of these hemangiomas are quite small, most of them will involute to an acceptable level. But that means that a large proportion of them don't. And if we look at those that take more than six years to involute, more than half of these patients will be seeking uh, help later on in life in order to improve, again, their appearance or function, um, which leads to the question of what is acceptable. Okay, so these are small hemangiomas, you know, one in a very cosmetically and functionally sensitive area. And this is after involution. I would think all of us would agree that this is basically acceptable, but is this acceptable? If this is my daughter, is this good enough? 100%, yes, it has involuted, but is it good enough? And this is that same child after involution. She's at the age where very little is likely to happen. So one of the ways we determine of how or the timing of when we intervene has to do with the development of self. Children at these different points along the natural history of hemangiomas, if we overlap that with the development of self, at 18 months of age, if you place a rouge mark on the cheek of a child and they look at themselves in the mirror or a post-it note, they will take it off. They will notice, they will know that that is them in the mirror. Prior to that, they do not. And then certainly by the time children are three years of age, that sense of self, this is me in the mirror, that's not a playmate. But when somebody says, what's that uh, pointing to the tip of the nose of the child, they know that it's being talked about them. And certainly by the time that they go to school, so these are two twins, every time this child was asked to be taken a picture of, she would start to cry. This is not a posed picture. Um, and uh, certainly by the time this child goes to school, about five, six, seven years of age in the US, um, is this good enough? So the aims of treatment is to affect total resolution, treat complications or set stage for multimodality treatments. The options are observation, laser, medical surgery, in combination, which we will go through all of those. It is totally appropriate to watch a lesion. So there may be a very small lesion um, or even a moderately sized lesion, for example, on the back, which um, is proliferating. We may choose to watch it rather than intervene because of the age of the child, the location of the lesion, the stage of the lesion. And then we can change track if we need to, depending on what's happening. So a small lesion on the upper eyelid is gonna have a very different impact than a small lesion on the shoulder, for example, even though they may look exactly the same. Laser treatments, which I know you're all familiar with, there's a multitude of wavelengths and lasers that we can use. The pulse dye laser is the most common one, um, which can affect total resolution of very thin superficial proliferating lesions. Um, it can also be used to treat complications. So ulceration, which happens in about 10% of hemangiomas um, around the diaper area, uh, particularly and the, uh, the lips um, can be treated with the PDL and within one or two treatments that lesion heals. In this anatomic area, obviously we may do nothing else, but in this anatomic area, it sets the stage for further treatment. Medical therapy can be the definitive primary modality, or it could be adjunctive as we do some other things. So clearly in the face of severe functional impairment, we need to do something uh, and uh, medical therapy ends up being the, 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 the treatment of choice. And then it can be adjunctive um, as well. And I'll show you that child in just a second. Traditionally corticosteroids were what we use. Rapamycin or serolimus is the one that I mentioned recent, or earlier today uh, with regards to venous malformations and other malformations. It is also possible that it has an effect on um, infantile hemangiomas. And then propranolol has become the medical therapy of choice. Interferon and vincristine in the United States are not used anymore because of the uh, incidence of neurologic um, secondary problems. Corticosteroids suppress VEGF. So again, here you have a vascularized tumor after treatment or exposure to, um, 
to uh, dexamethasone, you see the microvessel density goes down, the expression of um, the hemangioma stem cell VEGF mRNA goes down. So again, very, very effective uh, treatment. This was a child I treated before propranolol, has proptosis, has very large mass um, here. And again, we placed her on, um, on corticosteroids, high doses, the proptosis resolved, treated these areas with the pulsed eye laser and were able to get a, diff a, a reasonable result. Again, nowadays, um, this has been supplanted by the use of uh, propranolol. Rapamycin, again, to recap, here's that VEGFR2 receptor, which I said was so important. The downstream effects, mTOR, which is um, the mamal mammalian target of rapamycin, is what's blocked by serolimus or rapamycin. And then that blocks the downstream expression of VEGF through blocking of the HIF or the hypoxia factor, which we mentioned already. So again, rapamycin has a potential for use in hemangiomas, a definite use in malformations. We did a study where we applied topical rapamycin to uh, nude mice that had been implanted, and it showed that it works topically through absorption through the skin. And um, we, in fact, used topical rapamycin for some the lymphatic malformations and venous malformations that are involving the surface. Um, because um, uh, propranolol is so effective for hemangiomas, uh, rapamycin really is probably not going to become very useful in those. However, for KHE and malformations, as I mentioned, it has become very useful. In 2008, there was a, a case report in the New England Journal of uh, children that were treated for um, with large uh, hemangiomas with high dose steroids. They developed cardiomyopathies due to the steroids. The cardiomyopathy was treated with propranolol and the steroids were removed and the hemangiomas got better. From that day on, everybody and their mother started using propranolol for everything. Well, now we know a lot more about it and, uh, and where its appropriate uses are. Number one, there is no appropriate use for propranolol with malformations. So that is something to keep in mind. There are different types of beta adrenergic receptors that are expressed on hemangiomas. So there is some work trying to see, are there other types of uh, beta blockers which may be used rather than propranolol in Europe? I think um, natalol and atelanol are used more uh, commonly than in the United States. But again, it's this, is there a difference between the receptors that has some clinical implication? This is a very uh, good slide, which shows how um, beta, um, uh, how beta blockers, I'm sorry, how um, the effects of um, promotion of, excuse me, the confusing thing about this slide is that it is not showing what beta blockers do. It is what beta blockers um, or the, uh, uh, not the inhibitor does. So we've taken this slide to show that the propranolol effects in relation to these, uh, these different effects is this. So propranolol blocks vasodilation um, by blocking the, uh, by causing vasoconstriction, by blocking the effects of nitrous oxide. It also blocks angiogenesis by blocking that cascade that we've talked about a few different times. Again, these receptors may be the switch that, um, that opens up the access to the VEGFR2, that whole cascade that we talked about. It also blocks the part of the cascade that leads to the, the HIF um, um, cascade as well, the hypoxia one induced one. And finally, it um, promotes apoptosis. Um, so these are the three ways that beta blockers are thought to um, be effective in the treatment of, um, of infantile hemangioma. And again, Propranolol in during a time when um, the baby should or the tumor should have been growing or we would have expected it to grow, 
with propranolol, it actually decreases. And certainly within the time where this tumor was expected not to do much else, actually got better as well with propranolol. So again, during periods where we expected the tumors to get bigger, propranolol actually had an effect to, to one, stop proliferation and then drive involution. So it has become the standard first uh, line of defense or treatment for medical management. I use hemangiol, which is a particular formulation of propranolol, and we can talk about the differences of that in just a second. Um, there is a topical formulation, which is only useful really for very thin, very superficial lesions. Um, and uh, for most of the things that we see or that I see, it's not as, as common. Combination of propranolol plus the pulse dye laser and a proliferating segmental uh, infantile hemangioma, which finally leads me to surgery, which as a surgeon, of course, is my favorite part of the, the topic. And we can affect total removal. We can set the stage for further treatment with the laser. We can excise the tumors in serially. Uh, we can decrease the size of the tumors. And then we can also treat the, um, the sequelae of the, the natural history. Surgery um, is, uh, had been avoided for these because the misconception that they were bags of blood. I've shown you that they're solid tumors, that they're numerous feeders. There really aren't. There may be one or two vessels. The risk of bleeding uh, in the literature, all the aborted cases of massive bleeding are most likely misdiagnosed venous malformations, not hemangiomas, and the tumors do not infiltrate the surrounding tissues. They push. Um, <clears throat> this is just uh, some some uh, examples just to show you that when we make the incision, um, the tumor is a solid tumor. There is a plane between the tumor and the underlying tissues, the normal tissues. And then if you cut into the tumor, like I said, it is a solid uh, mass, not a bag of blood. Um, and then obviously that can be closed depending on the area. This, uh, this is a uh, patient of, of mine who, um, Again, resected partially. We didn't want to remove all the skin when she was a baby because it could potentially cause extropion. We then treated this with the pulse dye laser, let some time go by, and this is her now. Um, uh, we are friends on Facebook, as a matter of fact. Um, another child, again, showing how these are solid tumors that can be dissected off of and from the surrounding tissues. And this is a week post-op, um, just showing that the amount of uh, impingement on the visual axis is being improved. The child that I showed you before, this is too large to be removed in toto. So what we do is you can create a plane within the hemangioma. Again, it's a solid mass and then uh, remove um, a large portion of it and then treat the area with uh, or the residual with uh, the pulse dye laser. And this is now um, she is now in college here in the United States. And um, again, through Facebook, it gives us an opportunity to follow some of these patients long, long term. Similar thing, compound hemangioma. There is no potential for this to involute to an acceptable level. Um, so again, with a couple of excisions and some laser treatment, again, we can get a very acceptable result. The nasal tip, a particularly important area, same premise. We can dissect the tumor from the lower lateral cartilages and from the septum and from these areas, redrape the skin, ex um, excise some of the expanded skin. And um, again, just another example of the tumor being dissected away and then an early um, result there. Um, this is a sequence that uh, is in a paper that we wrote. And uh, this little girl was um, was, was this girl at, uh, as an infant. And then um, she was on the cover of, that, of the journal. And then again, through Facebook, uh, we've been able to get a more recent picture of a selfie of her showing how it does not affect the growth. Again, this is of course not a professional photograph, but it gives us the idea that at least uh, socially she's able to um, take pictures and, and uh, same thing, nasal tip. Um, the Cyrononos, for example, this is now here many years later, having graduated from college. 
different area of the, of the nose, but same premise. We can dissect the tumor out from underneath the uninvolved skin and obtain a result in one operation that would otherwise take years to achieve and then probably would have required another operation anyway. <clears throat> same thing. Another young boy, and again, within you know a short procedure, we now have set the stage for further um, scar revisions, but there is no way to expect realistically that this would have involuted to acceptable degree. The last couple of things that I wanna show you is that occasionally we'll have tumors that are not resectable in toto. So what we do is we've taken the idea of what we do with some of the melanocytic nevi and some of these other lesions, where we excise them serially. We remove a portion of the tumor, close it primarily, remove another portion of the tumor, and slowly we achieve primary closure in, an, in, in a lesion that had we resected this in toto in one operation, would have required a complex reconstruction in a very small infant, which of course we wanna to try to avoid. So again, we just took the, uh, the concept of serial excisions and adapted them or applied them to facial hemangiomas. And I do this all the time. This is, um, it is preferable to do a couple of procedures and obtain primary closure than to have to use a, um, a reconstructive uh, complex uh, technique. Finally, again, the, the, the norm in most of these is some sort of multimodality. So whether it's medical therapy, plus or minus lasers, um, and plus or minus surgery ends up being the common combination. Um, so obviously very large, unable to remove it in toto in one place, so we did a serial excision. However, the nose, that is all propranolol and laser, okay? So there are areas which, of course, Surgery isn't the most appropriate. The technique that we're using now is uh, in the past in order to remove this, which is no longer involuting and is quite, would be a large incision to remove all of that. And we know, as I've mentioned, that these are solid tumors. So taking that into account, what I've started doing is actually using minimal incisions. I've placed an endoscope in there just to show, just for interest's sake, but then using this sonopet or uh, an ultrasonic dissector through these small incisions, we can then debulk the lesion and obtain at least a decrease in the bulk or in the volume, and then set the stage for using laser there. Same thing, the flank, one small incision and debulking of the tumor. Um, variety of different um, approaches there for the uh, glabellar area. And then finally, what I'd like to close with is, you know, is there a consensus? Do we all agree on management? So we looked at my experience of uh, 86 nasal tip hemangiomas, and we compared my clinical experience um, and the best available evidence through a systematic review. And in fact, we're all kind of doing the same thing. We all agree now that the, the trend has shifted to early intervention with multimodality to achieve the best possible results by the time these children are two and a half to three years of age, so that they will then, this is basically a story that they hear about themselves rather than something that they're living through once they've developed a sense of self. In summary, hemangiomas and malformations are distinct anomalies of which the diagnosis is crucial. We have a standard nomenclature, which we should all use so that when we talk, we can understand each other. There are multiple treatment options. Any vascular lesion which appears or grows during the first month of life should be evaluated. It may never need treatment, but at least the diagnosis can be established. If a vascular lesion is proliferating, in a cosmetically or functionally sensitive area, it of course should be evaluated. Again, may not need treatment, but the diagnosis and the plan can be made early on. If there is a vascular lesion which is persistent after two years of age, it should be evaluated because it may not in fact be a hemangioma, it may be a malformation which has no hope of getting better and should be treated and the, in a plan set for lifetime. And again, the treatment should be geared toward getting the best possible result commensurate with this development of self. 
So again, the final summary would be that leave it alone, uh, it will go away, which is what I was taught in medical school, is not the universally acceptable advice for all vascular anomalies uh, today. And again, I would like to thank uh, everybody for your attention and uh, for having me, given me the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you, Dr. Halal. Uh, Dr. Hilal, you are on uh, mute. Can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, 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 can you repeat it? Hey, right. Uh, can we just open now the discussion uh, or any comment, any question regarding the issue for, of, uh, of all uh, aspects, uh, aesthetically or functionally or pathology or pathophysiology of the treatment regarding surgical treatment? Uh, uh, from Dr. Adil, is there any question or any comment regarding uh, yes. our of malformation, please? Yes, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Marcelo for his, uh, uh, his, his uh, sharing of, our, uh, of his knowledge and valuable information. Uh, and I'd like to, to ask uh, some questions about this problem. Uh, do you routinely use this aerotherapy before surgery in this such uh, vascular malformation? And what is the material you inject uh, in before surgery? And what is the time uh, timing before surgery? This is the first question. Professor Marcello. Yes, yeah, so the, the, in terms of the vascular malformations um, that we end up operating on, we, I mean, we consult, of course, with IR colleagues. I do not personally do sclerotherapy or embolization. That is something that the, the radiologists do. In terms of the material, there are a variety of ones that they use. They use alcohol, they use sotrodecol, they use onyx. And again, how and why they choose those was really beyond my area of, of expertise. If we're going to use embolization uh, prior to surgery, we will usually do that within 48 hours of surgery. So the idea is to try to decrease the blood, um, the vascularity of the, of the lesion in order to be able to debulk it. We're not trying to remove the whole thing in those cases. Um, in those occasional cases where there's really, you know, a focal lesion that we're removing its entirety, um, I don't typically uh, engage the, the IR uh, colleagues for that. Thank you, Professor Marcelo. Uh, is this okay, Dr. Adel? Your second question. Yes, yes, yes okay. Uh, another question, uh, what is, uh, do, you, do you recommend the probranol treatment in any age or you have, or, or there is a uh, age that is uh, safe to start probranol and to avoid cardiological side effects, especially in this infant uh, and the newborn babies? Yeah, so that's a great question. <clears throat> we didn't spend a lot of time on propranolol specifically, but propranolol um, or hemangiol, which is the, um, the proprietary formula of, um, yeah. of propranolol, which is, you know, the conforms to the European standards, which is a little bit stricter than the uh, US FDA standards, which is my preference. Um, we really, if you look at the side effects um, in all the big, big studies, um, the most common side effect, which occurs in about 10 to 15% of children, is sleep disturbance. Um, so 85% of children either sleep as well or as poorly as they did before the treatment. But this is significant sleep disturbance where they have night terrors, that type of thing that may cause having to decrease the medication. So that only occurs in about 10 to 15, and that is the most common side effect. The cardiology or the uh, cardiac um, potential things such as low uh, blood pressure or, um, or uh, bradycardia only occurs in about 1%. So it is literally the least common of the side effects of um, of hemangiol. And if you think about the doses that we're using compared to what the cardiologists use for sick babies that have cardiac, it is very different, very, very different. So we, um, 
when we first started using propranolol, all the babies got EKGs, chest x-rays, blood work, observation. Now, as long as the baby is five kilos or more, has no other medical issues or concerns, obviously, or are not significantly premature, we literally will write a prescription and they start it at home um, because the studies have shown that they're just, you don't pick up any new pathology that would have then changed the management with, with the drug. Extraordinarily safe, extraordinarily effective. And uh, so we really, if, the, if it is appropriate to be used in a particular lesion, um, the sooner the better which also means that you will be treating the baby longer, right? Because you wanna treat beyond the point where the tumor is proliferating and then into regression. So the sooner you start it, the less tumor is likely to proliferate, which means that there's less tumor to regress as well. It's quite uh, safe, uh, safe material. Yeah. Very safe. Not, not that side effect, right. Uh, Dr. Adel, is there any more questions, please? Uh, one, one more last question from the audience is, uh, what is the role of laser uh, therapy in Sturge-Weber syndrome? Sturge-Weber syndrome, Professor Marcin. So Sturge-Weber syndrome um, and laser therapy, I think is the question. Um, so if in terms of Sturge-Weber, so it is the capillary malformation, <laughs> Um, is, is no different than the other capillary malformations that we treat. So um, the, the same quandaries that we have for treating CMs at Port Weinstein's with the lasers is the same. So all of the CMs will, will respond to some degree. Very few don't respond at all, but very few will clear completely. So the idea is to try to prevent some of the proliferation that can occur over time. So some of the CMs, um, you know, will become nodular, can become, can bleed, you can get hypertrophy of the tissues. So we like to try to prevent that, or we think we're trying to prevent that. Um, the reality is that for each individual patient, there comes a point where we stop treating and just kind of wait and see what happens. But the earlier you treat the baby, so very early on within the first you know, few months, um, the skin is very translucent. Um, so there's some optical qualities that favor the use of the lasers. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that every single baby gets treated you know, within the first couple of months, but there's a definite role, whether it's Sturge Weber or just a, car a capillary malformation, for laser therapy. Topical serolimus, topical rapamycin is now being used in combination with uh, PDL therapy as well for some of these uh, CMs with or without Sturge Weber. Um, you know, with Sturge Weber, part of the, the main focus initially is seizure control and ophthalmologic issues and that type of thing. And the, uh, the CM becomes just part of the, uh, the process. So. Thank you, Professor Marcel. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Adel from Riyadh. Uh, any Thank question you. or any comment from you, Dr. Hazim from Cairo, please. I, uh, first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Marcelo about uh, the very nice and uh, precise presentation. And I want to ask uh, first question about uh, there is any uh, method that can detect the hemangioma or vascular malformation uh, intranatal uh, uh, to infant and any any procedure can uh, can prevent uh, the, the regression or progression of uh, disease. Uh, this is the first question, uh, Professor Marcelo. So so uh, during routine prenatal examinations <clears throat> with ultrasound, you know, oftentimes you know babies will be found to have a variety of masses, you know, for all sorts of diagnoses, including. Um, you know, lymphatic malformations, particularly some venous malformations and, um, and congenital hemangiomas. So if it, it just depends on the, um, you know, the exam and what, so, and what type of prenatal care there is. Um, obviously with some of the very severe 
airway involvement and, uh, you know, the, the otolaryngology colleagues are involved in these, um, I think they call them exit procedures where they, um, you know, there's a whole team that delivers the baby um, and establishes an airway um, right away. Again, that can be determined and planned prenatally. As far as is there anything that can be done to prevent these, we really don't know of anything. You know, we don't know enough as to what the mechanism is. Um, so it really is right now hinged on early diagnosis, accurate diagnosis, and treatment. Thank you. Uh, the other question, uh, Dr. Hazim. About uh, in uh, the treatment of uh, infantile hemangioma, what's the treatment of a choice uh, must be started? And uh, when I can uh, shift it from medical uh, treatment from uh, one to another? Professor Marcello. Yeah, so this is something that we could spend, you know, really the entire time on and something that hopefully we'll have an opportunity as well to talk. So that's the key thing is how do you decide what to do and when? And that is absolutely tailored to the individual. So a five millimeter lesion in the middle of the forehead may be treated with topical timolol. It may be treated with the pulse dye laser. You could observe it. Um, unlikely that you would use propranolol. The same five millimeter lesion on the tip of the nose in a one week old baby, we would be very aggressive because we don't have any way of predicting what the tumor is going to do. So now you may choose to wait a week or so and see what happens. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. The mistake would be to say, come back in two or three months because then, you know, we've, we've sort of, you know, we can't go backwards. So that's why observation is different than leave it alone. I'll see you in five years. It's let's establish a period of time that we're gonna watch and see what happens and then reassess. A week later, I mean, sometimes we see these babies literally, I mean, I've seen them the day after they were born and it's impossible to tell sometimes even what the lesion is. Um, so I'll see them back in a week or two. All if right. something has changed, then we can then, you know, get the diagnosis right. If nothing's happened, maybe it's a malformation and then we can wait a little bit longer and you kind of, you know, finesse that. Once the diagnosis of IH is made and it is a, um, in a functionally or cosmetically sensitive area, then that's where the multimodality things come. Early on medical therapy, laser is still sort of in that early period as well. Laser can be used farther on to treat sequelae. Surgery really doesn't come into play until regression has started because if you can imagine, if you remove, and I did this early on in my career and learned the hard way, was um, if you remove part of the tumor and it's still growing, guess what? What you leave behind is still growing. So uh, very quickly, we ended up back where we started. So surgery, the goal, the role is really more in regression. So medical therapy, laser therapy, observation, a combination of those, and in my head, I always go through, and in fact, when I write my note, I always say that for this lesion, and I describe it, whether it's superficial, compound, deep, in this age patient, so a one-month-old is different than a nine-month-old, at this stage, whether it's proliferating or regressing, in this location, scalp versus nasal tip, these are the options that seem reasonable. And again, I'm thinking, what can we do now to get the best possible result by the time this child is two and a half to three years of age? So again, there's, it could be one treatment, it could be a series of treatments, it could be a combination of a series of treatments. Right, or surgical intervention. Right, any more questions, Dr. Hazim? No, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, now uh, we can see. Is there any more?
questions from the audience? Fritner Ibrahim said, can you put some if I, light? if I may, Dr. Hilal, there's one question that I see in writing, which um, I would yes. like to, to address. Right. Is that okay? Yes, address it, please. So one was, um, during the pandemic, how was telemedicine changed? Well, as you know, <laughs> telemedicine has been pushed forward probably 10, 15 years um, mm -hmm. by the pandemic, which is, um, which is interesting in and itself. Hemangiomas, and vascular anomalies are ideally suited for telemedicine. And the reason for that is that the diagnosis can be made very commonly, very easily, um, the way we're talking now. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's not the same as in person, and there may be, you know, there definitely are reasons to see the babies, and, but at least you can get an idea of the urgency or the priority of the uh, treatment um, uh, of whatever scheme or management that you that you would like to do. So I never used telemedicine before, except for by email, I would always get emails, you know, asking opinions with photos. Now we're a little more sophisticated, but now I use um, audio video to Zoom calls with the parents. Um, because it, it, it avoids trips and it avoids uh, exposures and all those kinds of things. And, and this, so uh, that's a very good question. Endorse, we have to endorse the telemedicine in this uh, important uh, anomalies, Yanni, regarding the appearance pictures and things. It will be much easy uh, to get some advice regarding the strategy of treatment, blah, blah, blah. Right. I agree. Yep. Yeah. And then there was one other question that I saw just to, um, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, again, one question is how can we determine if the hemangioma is cancerous? Yeah. <clears throat> again, if you think about the classification, mm -hmm. you need to then sort of work your way down those things. So uh, the vast majority are benign, right? However, if there is a tumor of the foot, for example, that is rapidly growing, and I have seen this personally, it was treated with propranolol at another institution, and it continued to grow, and um, they came to see me, then what the first thing we did was just biopsy it, you know, because if these tumors are so predictable in the way that they present that anything that starts falling outside of that natural history deserves special attention. So you always rely in the final instance is, is of a biopsy. And um, we always ask for GLUT1 because that differentiates between malformations and hemangiomas. And of course, in the in the case of a, of a cancerous lesion, then obviously pathology becomes um, important, so. The pathology, the pathology and the biopsy, right. Any more question you want to answer, Professor uh, Marcelo? How did you see this? Take it away. Clement, normally. It's written the link. It should be done. Mm -hmm. Any more comments, Professor Marcelo? I'm happy to address whatever. I don't want to take uh, you know people's time. I know it's late uh, where you are, but uh, I'm happy to participate. Okay. My email address, of course, is you know please disseminate that, and I'm happy to answer questions or be involved. You know, however you think is is appropriate. I should repeat. Thank you very much, Professor Marcelo Hoshman who is the chief surgeon at the Facial Surgery Center in South Carolina, USA. Uh, and he is the medical director and founder of Hemangioma Treatment Foundation in USA. Thank you again from, uh, for Dr. Adel Abdel-Fattah from Riyadh, mm -hmm. the head department. Thank of you. Uh, Dr. Hazim Dashan from Cairo, he's a plastic surgeon as well. And thank you, thank you finally to the Saudi German Hospital uh, group and Saudi German Hospital 
Academy. Thank you very much indeed, and have a good night. Uh, I, I just wanted to add one last comment here uh, for the audience that uh, Professor Hodgman uh, would be available in Saudi Arabia, and he will be our visiting professor uh, to treat the patients in the kingdom uh, once the travel resume back to normal. And uh, uh, the announcement uh, would be on our as Saudi Yemen hospitals marketing or like a social media post. Uh, we will update you. Excellent, Mr. Shobhan. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. All appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.